Well, we'll continue on in our study of the book of Colossians. Mm -hmm. Today is June 14th, and last week we finished up talking about uh, the supremacy of Jesus. And we welcome and, uh, you all. Yes. Whoever is joining us today, <laughs> we're glad you joined us. <laughs> oh, it's a beautiful day today, Joel. It is. Gorgeous. It is. Starting to warm up in Yuma. Yes. Going to get some 100 degree days here pretty quick. But yeah, but that's normal for that's Yuma. That's normal for Yuma, yeah. yep. And we like it. All right. Well, we left off, I think, in verse 20. And so we'll start with verse 21 today, okay. since that's the next verse. All right. <laughs> Let's just read a few verses here. Um, again, this is Colossians 1, starting verse 21. It says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Mm -hmm. But now he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and have been pro and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So it starts off here telling us that we were alienated. We were enemies of God. Um, Paul, several places, he starts off when he talks about the good news. First of all, he tells us, I guess you could say the bad news. Uh, why we need the good news because mm -hmm. a lot of people think that just being a good person is all that's required well I'm a good person uh, surely God will let me into heaven I've done a lot of good things in this life mm -hmm. and I've done more good things than bad but this is not what Paul's teaching here he says once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind now he's not talking to a bunch of people that are criminals and all, no. you know, rotten, no good people. These are just normal people that he's saying, you were alienated from God. You were enemies because of your evil behavior. Um, let me go back in Romans for chapter three. There's several places we could look here, but this one kind of sums it up. This is Romans chapter three and starting in verse nine. And he starts off here, he's talking about just the, the Jews. He says, what should we conclude, shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? In other words, as a Jew, do we have an advantage over, over the Gentiles? He says, not at all. For we've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it's written, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They've become, uh, uh, they've together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace, they do not know. There's, there's no fear of God before their eyes. Wow. So, I think you can conclude from that that Paul says, without Christ, we don't have any hope. <laughs> totally hopeless. <laughs> we are totally, yes, totally hopeless. We are not good people no. without Christ. And... The Bible says that what we deserve because of our sin. And of course, in Romans 3.23 says that we've all sinned. In Romans 6.23 says that, uh, I guess you call it the reward for that sin is death, death separation from God. But mm -hmm. the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So that's exactly what he's saying here. Once we're alienated, once we're enemies, but now, but now, he has reconciled you. He's yes. brought you back together with God. He's made you friends of God now. Yes. He's made you uh, acceptable to God. He's, uh, uh, he's qualified you 
now to become, as we talked about last week, he's qualified us to share in the inheritance. It says back in verse, uh, where is it? Back in verse 12, it says he's qualified us to be an inheritance, uh, be an, uh, share in the inheritance. And how did he qualify us? By what Jesus did on the cross. Yes, yes. He's yes. reconciled Jesus. you. And that talked about you. That talked about me. That talked about every one of us. Just as it talked, it was talking about every one of us over in Romans, where it said in the in the first part of this verse, where it says that we were alienated and and enemies. That's talking about all of us, but this includes all of us too. That He's reconciled us, all of us, by Christ's physical body through death. Yes. For what purpose? To present you holy or present you in his sight, present you holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation. Only God can do that. Yes, we can't sure. present ourselves as holy before God. Yes. We, we can't make ourselves without blemish because we know we've all got blemishes. We all know that there's things that could, there's accusations that could be made against us yes. for our thoughts and our actions, but because of what Jesus did, he says, God can present you as holy. Yes. And I, I was just, uh, as I was studying this, I come across something that I had never seen before. I was looking up this word holy, uh -huh. and it's a word called hagios in, in the Greek. Uh, but if you look up the word saint, it means exactly the same thing. I mean, it is the same thing. It's exactly the same Greek word. Holy and saint are the same Greek word. Huh. So when it says that God can present you, or when Jesus can present you holy in God's yeah. sight, it says he presents you as a saint. Good heavens. What is a saint? <laughs> it's just somebody that's been saved by the blood of Jesus. It's Whoa, not somebody that's done some special miracles and that some committee has oh, uh, examined their life and decided they're worthy to be called saints. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says you're a saint. You're holy. And, and holiness doesn't, isn't, you know, because you walk around with, a halo showing around your head like all the the, the yeah, religious the pictures yeah, yeah. <laughs> show but it's just somebody that has made jesus their savior and their lord wow. and that makes you a saint that makes you holy and without blemish you can stand before god and and i know this is this is hard to accept every time i read this i, I it kind of blows my mind yeah. How can God do that? Just because of what Jesus did. Yeah. Scripture, and I've referred to this a number of times, but it's in 1 Corinthians 5, 20, 23, is it? Uh, 2 Corinthians, it is. It says that, that Jesus, who no, knew no sin, he that knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. How did Jesus become sin? Did he become sin by sinning? You know, did he no. go out and commit all the sins that he could do so it would all the punishment would be on him? No, it says he was without sin, right. but he became sin. He became sin by God laying the sin of the world upon him, putting upon him yes. all the sin and then pouring out his wrath upon that sin so that the penalty was paid. Well, in the same way that God put that, that sin upon Jesus, he put his righteousness upon us. He that knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Just as Jesus didn't become sin by doing sin, but by God putting upon it, we don't become righteous just by doing righteousness. We become righteous because God puts that righteousness on it, calls us righteous, calls us in right standing with him. Now, once we become righteous, once we become holy in his sight, then we should begin to change our conduct. We should, and that's yeah. uh, really what Paul wrote all these letters about, so that we would begin to change our conduct, begin to realize that now we're not, we're not the same people we were. We're new creations. Yes. And again, in the same uh, chapter in 2 Corinthians 5, 
If anybody's in Christ is a new creation. All the old stuff has passed away. Everything's becoming new. So we should be. A, there should be a change. Yeah. It's not that we accept that righteousness and then just go on acting like we always have, but we're to begin to walk in that righteousness. We don't become more righteous because we have the righteousness of God, but we experience more of that righteousness. Uh, we learn to walk in it. Um, I like to use the example of, you know, a baby being born into this world. Yeah. When a baby is born, it's, it's fully human, but it's not able to function too much. When we're born into the kingdom of God, we're a new creation. There's a new birth, as it talks about in John chapter 3. Yeah. And we're, we're born again. But we have to learn to walk in that new birth. We mm -hmm. have to learn how to walk and talk in, in the spirit. Just and as so, a, Along with us learning how to walk and talk, and you were using that illustration as a baby, you have parents that help you in that way. And so a young Christian has has those that come alongside and help them in mm -hmm. their in their young years definitely they well they maturing. definitely should yeah. you know it's uh, just as a baby would have a pretty rough time without having people yeah, helping him a, a young himself. christian would have a pretty rough time just on their own uh -huh. we need people we yeah. need people to help us and that's why we, it's good to get in a good bible teaching church uh -huh. it's why it's good to have other people around you that are that are strong Christians mm -hmm. that can help you and, and direct you in the right path. Because, yeah. you know, a baby doesn't doesn't know a whole lot. You know, babies yeah. will stick anything in their mouth and, uh, you know, they'll play with, they don't know, they don't know what's dangerous to them. That's yeah. why, you know, parents have to baby proof their house because babies, especially when they get to crawling and toddling around, why, They'll get into everything. They'll <laughs> yeah. drink or eat anything. They'll stick their fingers in everything and and put everything in their mouth. And and uh, some things are not safe. Well, it's the same way as a Christian. As a, as a new Christian, it's not like all of a sudden we're overwhelmed with all this knowledge yeah. and understanding of how to walk yeah. as a Christian. We need help. And, of course, we need to study the Word and see what the Word says. God's given us this Word to help us. To, to walk in that in that righteousness, to walk in that holiness, and uh, to to be the kind of the person that God wants us to be. Yes. But that holiness is a gift. You know, it's not something we can brag about. You know, you hear some people talk about people that act holier than thou. Well, uh -huh. it's nothing to brag about because no. it's a gift. It's it's a gift. It's not something we've earned. It's not something we can say, well, I earned this righteousness. I earned this holiness. No, it was a gift. Yeah. It is a gift, and there, there's no way you're ever going to earn it. It's all just strictly a gift. But he presents us in that, in that way, he presents us holy, blameless, with a, without accusation. Now, the enemy, of course, he will try and accuse us, but Jesus is our advocate, the Bible says. He's our advocate. He's the one yes. that said, no, Father, he's free from accusation because he's accepted me as his Lord and Savior. So he's, those accusations are not true. And, uh, you know, you can't have a better lawyer than Jesus. That's for sure. That's for sure, yes. <clears throat> but that's the way he sees us. Even as new, new babes, uh, that's the way he sees us. The thief on the cross was presented before God as holy, blameless, without yeah. accusation, even though he just made that confession of, you know, recognizing Jesus mm -hmm. for who he is, just minutes, hours, who knows how long it was before he passed away, but short time, he, he realized when he saw Jesus' reaction on, on the cross and and just uh, something about him he knew was different. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He realized that Jesus was not just an ordinary person. And what did Jesus tell him? He said, today, today. you're going to be with me in paradise. He didn't say, well, uh, you know, lots of luck, fella. You can't, you're, you're not baptized and you haven't attended church and you haven't uh, read the Old Testament scriptures and 
and you know you haven't done all these other things so you know I'd like to save you but sorry no and he recognized Jesus um, as, as God's son and Jesus accepted him he just in his case it came at that point when you know when uh, he was about to die mm -hmm. now that doesn't mean that we can wait until we're about to die to make a profession of faith mm -hmm. for one thing if we really believe that uh, this all this is true um, then to wait is like saying well i'm not really sure it's all true yeah you know if we really believe this we would make a we would accept what jesus did for us we would say yes lord i want to accept that i want to be accepted i want to be presented before you holy and blameless yes. and the other thing is that we don't always know that we're going to have that opportunity some people die very suddenly accidents heart attacks all kinds of things that happen and you don't know that you're going to have that opportunity before you die to make that profession so if you have that opportunity today and you haven't taken advantage of it then another scripture says today is a day of salvation not next week not when you die not uh, when you're laying on your deathbed but today is that day and it says and and, and again uh, that doesn't mean that we can uh, just continue to live our old life, you know, and, and then just at the last minute ask God to forgive us for all the mistakes we've made. Uh, God wants us to live for him, to live a godly life. That's why he saves us. He wants to do a work in our lives so we can be the light of the world, as, it, as Jesus said that we are. And we do that as if we remain says if we continue in your faith in yes. other words if we continue to believe that jesus is the one who does the work we continue to believe that he's the one that, that saves us uh, he's the one that changes not only does he save us but he's the one that changes us mm -hmm. and and we can't change ourselves only you know we can certainly change some habits sometimes we can make some improvements in our life but really to change our heart that takes god to do it so we can't change yourself but we can help god by being willing by being obedient yes and the other hand we can hinder god by being disobedient by rebelling against god and saying oh, i don't want to give up that habit you know i kind of enjoy that habit that's kind of pleasurable or whatever we need to we need to be obedient to what he says and do what he says and and uh, be willing to let god change us and not be moved from the hope he says it's held out in the gospel what is that hope again that hope is salvation being Jesus. saved yeah being spending eternity with god mm -hmm. uh, and hope uh, i don't know i may have said mentioned this before but hope is not the kind of hope most people talk about today well i sure hope that's going to happen i hope i win the lottery i hope you know that i go to him no this is a hope that is a sure hope yes you know in, in the uh, Rome, uh, hebrews where it talks about that hope being our anchor it hope is just something that is off in the future it's a hope that we know is coming but it's it's not here now you know we're still here on this earth we're not in eternity well in one sense we're in eternity we've entered into eternity when we accept jesus as lord but we're still living in this world we haven't moved off into the next world yet so that hope is talking about it's it's an anchor it's something that holds holds us onto the the right path it's knowing that it, it's out there but it just hasn't come yet yeah. it's it's but it's coming it's on its way he says this is the gospel this is the good news that you've heard and it's been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which i paul become a servant you say well how, how has this been preached you know to every every creature well let's go back to romans chapter one and we'll just briefly touch on that it says 
in Romans 1, verse 20, it says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what's been made, so that people are without excuse. Some people say, well, you know, I just never heard. I didn't know there was a God. Well, all you got to do is look at nature and look at the, the way this world is all put together and uh, the way it's all holding together. We yeah. saw in, in the last week, it talked about that Jesus is the one that's holding everything holding together. together yeah. What holds this universe? What holds this whole solar system in, in, in the order that it is? Well, there has to be something to it, holding it together, and that's, that's Jesus. So uh, and there's, there's got to be, you know, there's not a, an excuse for saying, well, I, I just didn't know. I just didn't know. We all know yeah. deep down. A lot of people don't want to believe it. A lot of people want to just believe that we're just here by accident and there's nothing holding all this world together, but it's uh, God doesn't accept that as an excuse. That's what he said back there in Romans. They're, not, they're, they're without excuse. And it goes on, and Paul says, now, verse 24, now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what's still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that's been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people to him, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Paul says, I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you. Uh, why was he suffering for them? Well, this church was mostly a Gentile church, uh -huh. um, and that was basically why Paul was suffering, was for the Gentiles. If he wasn't preaching... Uh, that the Gentiles were acceptable to God, he wouldn't have been suffering so much. Yeah. You go back in the, uh, one of the, toward the end of the book of Acts when Paul was arrested. Uh, he was in the temple, and when he came out of the temple, or at least somewhere around the temple, some of the Jews grabbed him and started beating on him and saying he'd defiled the temple because they'd seen him with a with a Gentile earlier, and they assumed that he had taken the Gentile into the temple, which he hadn't. But anyway, they were beating Paul, and they were trying to kill him. And the Romans came along and saved him and, and took him in to arrest him. But as, as, he was, as they were taking him away, Paul asked the, the centurion if he could address the crowd. And so he gives him permission to, and Paul starts talking about Jesus, how he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, how he knocked him off his horse and told him all these things, and he'd been preaching Jesus. And every, all the crowd was just listening. They were fine until Paul made this remark. He said, God told me he was going to send me to the Gentiles. And uh -huh. that started the riot all over again. <laughs> they tried to kill him again because that was, I mean, they... They had a hard enough time accepting, you know, Jesus as, as being the Son of God, but uh -huh. that the Gentiles could come in and be saved just like the Jews without becoming Jews, uh -huh. that that was Stepping that was it. The line there. If, if Paul had just uh, rejected that, had not gone to the Gentiles, and if he had preached, you know, well, you still need to be circumcised and whatnot, he, he wouldn't have been suffering all these things. So. Basically, his suffering was because of the Gentiles, because of the church proclaiming that Jesus was God, was the Son of God and equal with God. And he didn't, he wasn't complaining, he wasn't griping. He said, I rejoice in the Sermon on the Mount. He's, Jesus said, you know, when you're persecuted for me, why well, rejoice, you know, that you're considered worthy to be you know, to suffer for me. He says, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have problems. But be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. We see when Paul and Silas were arrested back when they started the church in Philippi, they were beaten, first of all, and then 
thrown into stocks and and it says at midnight you know when most of us would have been griping and complaining and saying god you know we've been serving you with all our strength and this is what happened no it says they were worshiping god they were praising and thanking god paul wasn't a griper wasn't a complainer he says, so I rejoice in what I'm suffering, what I'm going through. And I fill up in my flesh what's still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is the church. Um, I know I'm not totally clear on all this. One thing I do know when he says that what's lacking in regard to Christ's affliction, there was nothing lacking in what happened on the cross. No. Uh, the only thing I can figure here is talking about that uh, the the suffering that he's doing is is because of Christ. When uh, again going back to Paul's conversion, when Jesus knocked him off his horse and and he said, "What did he ask Paul?" He said, "Why are you persecuting me?" Well, Jesus was already dead. How could he be persecuting him? Well, because he was persecuting the church, and so basically, when uh, well when Saul, Paul, Saul, Tarsus, Paul asked him, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Well, basically he's saying, when you persecute my people, when you uh -huh. persecute my church, which is my body, you're persecuting me. Yes. And so the, the, the uh, suffering that Paul was going through was, uh, was because of his stand for Jesus, because of his uh, representing Jesus. And so when the church goes through persecution, it's like they're not just persecuting the church, they're persecuting Jesus. And so if people persecute you, say bad things about you, reject you because of your belief in Christ, and just realize that, hey, they're rejecting Jesus. They're not rejecting you. And so don't take it personal. Don't get all upset when you suffer. You know, that's, that's, that's just part of, Part of being a Christian, yeah. you know, that we we've got an enemy, and he hates us, yeah. and he's going to do everything he can to keep this gospel from being spread. And he's going to keep do everything he can to keep you from sharing the gospel and from you know living the kind of life yeah. that God wants you to live. And uh, but he's really persecuting Jesus. He don't he don't really care about you. He just he hates God. And he hates everything that has to do with God. And yeah. because you belong to God, then he hates yeah. you just as a, as a reflection of his hatred for God. And he knows he can't defeat God, so he just figures he'll defeat as many of God's kids as he can, bring suffering on them as, as much as he can. Paul says, I become its servant. That is the gospel servant. You could talk about that being uh, its servant. It could be the gospel servant. Uh, it could be the church's servant, which is Christ's body. But he says, I become its servant by the commission God gave to me to present you where the word of God in its fullness. God called Paul. He didn't call himself. We don't call ourselves to be apostles or prophets or for that matter even pastors it has to be a calling that god gives us you know nowadays unfortunately a lot of times some of these ministries are are self-appointed by people but truly it's only god that can call us to these these ministries and we might call ourselves by certain ministry but if god hasn't called us uh then we're not going to be very effective in it we need to know what god's called us to do <clears throat> and he says, I, I want to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that's been keep, kept hidden for ages and, and generations, but now is disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Bible talks about several different mysteries. And... Um, I got them written down here somewhere. And this is one of them here. It talks about uh, the mystery of Christ in you. Yeah. The hope of glory. In the Old Testament, 
God didn't live in people. He dwelled in the temple. I mean, that didn't wholly contain God, but that's where he met with people. Uh, his spirit would come upon people at times and they would prophesy or do great things, but mm -hmm. God didn't live in his people. But Jesus talked about the fact way back in John before he got crucified, he says, you know, if you believe in me and you trust in me, we'll come and make our abode in you. And so he's come to live in us now. Uh, it's, it's not just a spirit coming on us occasionally, but it's a spirit living within yeah. us. And uh, in several different places, it talks about the mystery. It talks about uh, Jesus being God in the flesh. That was a mystery. The Messiah, uh, the, the Jews were expecting a Messiah, but they were just expecting somebody like Moses, like David. Somebody would come along and deliver uh, Israel out of the Roman occupation and make Israel another uh, uh, mighty force in the world again they didn't they had no expectation of of the messiah being god in the flesh coming to earth as a human being that was totally foreign to them even though if you study once you know that and you go back and study the old testament you realize it was spoken about but i believe even the prophets had spoken didn't fully understand what they were saying it was a mystery to them um in Romans 11, 25, it talks about a mystery and that the Jews would be hardened for a time, for a time until the uh, Gentiles would come into the church. That was never anything that the Jews thought about. I mean, as far as they were concerned, they were God's people and they were always going to be the chosen ones and, yeah. and going to be the preeminent ones that God worked through. And certainly God's not through with the Jews yet. Uh, and he's still going to do great things through him, but he's also brought the Gentiles in. Mm -hmm. And the other thing it talks about, a mystery, was in Ephesians 3, 6, was the fact that the Jews and the Gentiles were going to be co-heirs. Yes. Again, that was a mystery to them. They never, the Jews would have never thought that, you know, yeah. the Jews and Gentiles would be on an equal footing. You know, if, if you're a Gentile and you want to be equal to the Jews, you got to get circumcised and follow the Old Testament laws. And, uh, and that was, again, one of the reasons that the, the Jews hated Paul, because he was preaching that. Um, and then here where it talks about Christ being in us. So there's several things that uh, talk about being mysteries, but God is beginning to reveal them now to us. He's revealed most of these things to us. But the one thing that uh, is common to all these mysteries, who's the center of all this mystery? Jesus. It's Jesus. Yeah, all these things have to do with Jesus. Yeah. Jesus was God made in the flesh. Jesus comes to live with it. Jesus is the one that brings the Jews and the Gentiles together and puts them on equal footing and makes them co-heirs. And Jesus is the one that's, that said come to... Uh, live in us such as the hope of glory all these things all this mystery is around jesus yeah. they knew the old the uh, jews knew that a messiah god had promised a messiah but again they had a totally different idea yeah. uh, he was going to be a national hero another like say another king david to rise up and bring victory to the jews but the fact that he would be a suffering Messiah, that he would be God in the flesh, that he would come and dwell in us, that he would bring the Jews and the Gentiles together, all those things. They didn't understand that, and they didn't even like that idea. <laughs> they, they detested that idea. God, we've been your chosen people, and it's not going to change. Well, again, this hasn't changed in one sense. They are, they were God's chosen people for a chosen um chosen event for the, for Jesus to come through them. And they're still, God's chose them for certain things, but God's also chosen us. He's chosen the Gentiles to, to know the truth. He's chosen the Gentiles to be co-heirs with, with the Jews, to be co-heirs with Jesus. And so this, this mystery now is, is not so much a mystery because God revealed it to us. And he says, he's the one we proclaim. 
Who's he? Well, of course, that's Jesus. He's the one we proclaim. Uh, was it 1 Corinthians, I believe it is, about two, chapter 2 or 3, where Paul says, uh, I just, I know nothing except Jesus and him, or I preach nothing except Jesus and him crucified. This is, this is what it's all about. Uh, he's the one that we proclaim. He doesn't pr proclaim a, a doctrine, even though there's doctrine in here. He doesn't uh, proclaim a religion. Mm -hmm. he, he proclaims a man. He proclaims a person. Yeah. It's all about that person. It's not so much about, you know, do's and don'ts. He doesn't proclaim a list of things that we're to do. He proclaims Jesus, Jesus. as Lord, as Savior, as God in the flesh. He says, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. He says, I proclaim this. I admonish everyone. I teach everyone so that we can present people fully mature. Uh, what does it mean to be matured? I think King James says the word perfect, but uh, it really is more, it's, it's mature in Christ. And sometimes we think of maturity comes only with age, but I know a lot of Christians that are been Christian for years and they're not very mature. And yet I see other Christians that are young Christians that seem to be very mature. Mm -hmm. Maturity just, it, it really refers to how much you're applying what you've learned and how much you're struggling to learn. Just like we talk about some kids, you know, that seem, boy, he's really mature for a nine-year-old or he's yeah. really mature for a 12-year-old. Now, when they're 30 years old and they're still acting like they were a nine-year-old, you think, well, they're not so mature <laughs> anymore. But maturity grow is not that you, well, I've reached maturity and that's, you know, that's the end. No, maturity changes as we grow older. The more we know and the more we understand about Christ and the more we understand about what he's commanded us to do, we're to grow. Yeah. And, and, you know, a two-week-old Christian can be mature in his knowledge. He's mature to the point that he has understanding. But again, as he continues on in the word as he continues on in his christian walk then he needs to learn more he needs to change other areas that god will begin to show him uh -huh. you know it's not like we we, we confess jesus lord and savior and zap presto you know we're we're just uh, know everything god wants us to do and just walk in his uh path from then on but it's as we learn some things we can uh, do as young Christians, when we get a little older, God says, okay, it's time for you to give that up. You know, we don't get real upset with, you know, a two-year-old sucking his thumb, but, you know, when they get to be 10 years old, well, you know, I think it's time you quit sucking your thumb, you know, you're getting a little old for that. And and so maturity uh, is its growth, really. As we, we grow in Christ. We, yeah, we grow in the grace and the knowledge of God. Yeah, we don't stay, how do I say it? I don't stay stagnant. We don't, there's no, there's no plateaus. You know, God sometimes will give us a resting place where, you know, we'll go through growth spurts and man, it just seems like God's telling us new things every day. And it's like, man, I'm just having a hard time keeping up. And then we'll get maybe a plateau where we don't, God kind of lets us, you might say, rest, but then we can't stay there. We got to keep growing because if we quit growing, we start regressing, I believe. We start going back downhill. And he's, Paul says, this is, this, is what I'm, this is what I contend with. This is, I'm strenuously contending with all the energy that Christ so powerfully works in me. He says, I'm not doing this on my own. It's Christ that's working in me. Yes. It's Christ that puts this urgency in me to contend with you, to, to tell you, grow up, grow up. Be mature in Christ. Be, you know, as, as he talks about in other places, you know, there's some of you that, that uh, 
ought to be teaching others, and yet you're still needing teaching. Yeah. Now, all of us, I think we still all need still teaching need as long as we're still uh, still here on this earth. We still need teaching because we don't, we don't ever get all of it. But there comes a place where we ought to be teaching other people. You know, just like teachers in a the school, they, a good teacher doesn't quit learning just because now they're teaching kids. Good teachers, you know, a lot of them go back to school and get advanced degrees or they're reading books and studying new methods on how yeah. to teach kids and whatnot, and yet they're teaching what they learn. Well, we should be doing the same thing. And that doesn't mean we all need to be in the pulpit or teaching a Sunday school class or a Bible class. We got kids, we got friends, we got people we work with, people we go to school with, and we can be teaching by example. It's not that we have to sit down and say, okay, here's what the Bible says, here's what you need to do, but just by example. And as people ask you, you know, maybe hopefully they see something different about you. They see that your life is different than other people yeah. and you respond to situations differently than other people do. And, and you can sit down and tell them, this is why I am the way I am. This is what the word says. This is what God's done in my life. You know, that's what it's talking about. Again, it's not talking about necessarily being in a pulpit or being behind a, uh, or standing up in front of a, a group of people and, and going through a five-point lesson or whatever, but it's just by setting examples and by being ready, as uh, who said, Peter, that says it uh, to be... Uh, ready to give reason for the hope that's within you. Being able to tell people, why do you, why are you so joyful all the time? You just got chewed out by the boss and yet here you are smiling and working, you know, instead of going off moping, you're just going back and doing your job and actually working harder at it than you were before. Why are you that way? How come when everybody else gets, you know, when there's talk about laying people off everybody else is panicking and you're just going along whistling and carrying on just like always what's different about <laughs> you what's wrong with you and and there's opportunities to tell people about the hope we have within yeah. us so yeah. that's um hope is filled yeah with Jesus. that's that's part of growing up that's part of maturing in christ so all right well we could go on for a long time on this but it's all about Jesus. Yes, it is. It's all about him. Yes, it's not is. about us. It's about Jesus. So let's just end there, and we'll jump into chapter 2 next time. Okay. Father, we thank you for, Lord, for your word. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. He's the one, Lord, that because of what he did on the cross, his obedience, his willingness to go to that cross for us, Lord, that we can become the righteousness of God. We can be reconciled to you. We can be presented before you holy and without blame and free from accusation, Lord, only, only because of what Jesus did, not because of what we've done, Father, other than just accepting what's already happened, accepting what's already been done for us, Father. And so, Lord, if there's any that have not made that step yet, Lord, I just pray right now that you'd move on their hearts to do that. And those that have done that, Lord, I pray you just help them to continue to grow, Lord. That they never get tired of learning and, and, and growing, moving forward, maturing in their understanding, maturing in their walk with Christ, Father. Being that light, Lord, you said that we are the light of the world. The church, your people are to show, uh, to be a light, to show the world the way to go, Father. So help us to continue to be that light and our light might grow stronger and stronger lord and lead people in the right path father and we just thank you father for all you've done for us all you're going to continue to do with us father and we just bless your holy name father amen amen, amen. all right well we'll be back next week and go on in chapter two and learn more good stuff more mysteries yeah and uh so you have a great week and be blessed.